From Las Vegas, this is Sports Adrenaline. Hi, everyone. Tony Cardasco, John Castanino, Matt Gutierrez, Rick Strasser is on assignment. He actually has his uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, slam dunk and three-point contest tonight. Yeah, we're expecting highlights. So. Yeah. yeah. Haley Brooks is uh, on assignment as well. She's working NASCAR this weekend because she works at the, the Speed the Holler Parade, She's huh? The Holler Parade. Is that the Holla? Holla. Parade? The Howler. The Howler Parade. All right. And then uh, Luis Chalice Negretti is here with us, produced by Richard Giacovino. And we welcome you all to the Thursday night confab. So lots of news tonight. We'll start off with the Raiders uh, at the Stadium Authority meeting today. We'll have a recap, plus it's Combine Week for the Raiders in Indianapolis. We'll talk more about the proceedings, everything that's going there. John Gruden met with the press this week. We'll talk about that. The Vegas Golden Knights back on the ice tomorrow night. We'll take a look back at the two losses to the Kings and ahead as a future VGK member, Eric Carlson, and the Senators will be here <laughs> coming into town. The nice. running Rebels blown out at home last night. Boy, that was uh, a disaster, to <laughs> say the least, uh, by rival UNR. Uh, the UNLV football schedule came out today. It was announced. 51s broke ground on a new stadium. Uh, we have some uh, video for you and some interviews. The Las Vegas Lights, they fell again to another MLS team. And this is the start, gents, of a massive sports weekend ahead in Las Vegas. We've got NASCAR. We've got Vegas Sevens, which is rugby. We've got the UFC. We've got the WCC basketball tournament. VGK is at home. Uh, are we missing anything? I'm not sure, Tony. I, I mean, it's a long list, and it's, frankly, again, we, I mean, it's kind of the whole point that we started doing the show, though, hasn't it been? I mean, you know, the Raiders and the Golden Knights were kind of the impetus, but we realize, and that's the reason that we're doing this thing, is that, you know, this is a major sports market. There's not nearly enough coverage of it, and we hope to uh, fill a little gap um, that's in the market right now. Right. I mean, this is this is what we've been waiting for for 30-plus years, right, is the, mm -hmm. the, the ability to be able to talk about sports 24-7 in the city and talk about sports that are coming out of the city, not sports that are running around the country. These, these, are, all, these are all our teams now. These are all teams that are, that are going to be based or are – already based out of Las Vegas. Yeah, I'm finding it more difficult to do actual work these days with uh, games like every night and uh, all of these uh, big, massive uh, meetings here uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, today, the Stadium Authority Committee met, and uh, Matt Gutierrez, you were there. Uh, first, I guess we should start off with, uh, were there any resolutions announced uh, for, for parking? And what else uh, transpired? We talked on our podcast this past Monday about uh, the lengthy agenda uh, for the stadium authority. Well, they had 30-some-odd uh, documents on the table to go over. Um, they, they went through them a lot, a lot faster than I think anybody expected them to go through. And the reason for that is there was really no discussion on any of the, the items on the agenda. Um, these are all things that have been gone over relentlessly over the course of the last year plus. Uh, most of these, th these things have already been brought up at prior meetings. Um, they, knew, they knew what to expect. Uh, nobody sitting on the panel was, was necessarily surprised by any of the items that they brought up. So they just kind of uh, went through their checklist one by one, and they even made mention of all of the things on their checklist are, are being checked off and they're getting to the end of their checklist. So they just kind of went through each agenda item and uh, more or less broke it down for everybody that was there. If, there were a couple questions here and there where uh, Chairman Hill had to uh, more or less simplify things for everybody and, and you know break it down into its, into its simplest form for everybody to kind of understand. But other than, other than a couple of, hey, what about this, what about that? It was it was pretty straightforward. Uh, Mark Bedane got up before they got into all the agenda items and addressed the parking issue right away. Um, he said that they are currently working on 27,000 spaces. So they're, they're in negotiations with and have already started to draw up legal documents for 20, potentially 20, 27,000 spaces that are all going to be within a quarter mile to a mile and, mile and a half, and a half is what we of heard, the stadium yeah. site. Uh -huh. Now, if you do a little Google Maps, I know we've, we've been talking about it for a while. Bally High is about a mile away, a little over a mile away. But that's, you know, going out the, 
the entrance over there on the, the corner on it the, won't be there. of Russell and, and I have a feeling that's just side. not working out because they want it in like $75 million and there's all sorts of legal ramifications, right. I guess, going on right now. Well, I mean, no matter what, they're, they're, they're going to have enough spaces. That's the thing that Bedane wanted, wanted to let everybody know, that they were going to have parking. He said, even if we get half of that 27000 we're fine. Um, he actually addressed the whole parking issue as far as on-site parking um, and, and the game day experience. And we have a little, little clip from him just kind of talking about that here. with Los Angeles? Um, no, but like we said here earlier, the, there were some emotions there on the ice. Um, and I mean, it's fun. It's fun when it's, it's emotion. And, and there's Switch the videos, there Rich. The so uh, maybe in the future, we, there, there's more rivalry. William, did you feel uh, a couple of the goals a little self-inflicted? Uh, just obviously, we're, that you guys we're looking at William that's coming. Said. That's coming later. Yeah, we'll get show. to that in a little bit. That's yeah. not Mark Bedane, but... Um, uh, if we can pull that up, great. But he basically just talking about um, how a lot of the sites around. Part of the yeah, there are some stadiums that have really no parking on site, just a few hundred spots, and utilize either the downtown area or some uh, ancillary lots. Uh, there are some stadiums that do uh, a large sponsor activation. Ravens Walk comes to mind in Baltimore. Uh, Seattle, Seattle has a pretty vibrant. Uh, parking situation, Cleveland. Uh, so there's different scenarios. We're obviously blessed that we have land available to us in the surrounding areas, a business district uh, surrounding the, the property that I think will capitalize on the ability to utilize parking. Some of the gaming properties will probably want uh, to open up their garages if it's available, but they don't want to. They don't want to impact their, their their traffic in the property. Uh, but I think we're lucky here in that we have a lot of options available to us, and, and we'll investigate them all. And yeah, so, I mean, I, I haven't been to Baltimore, but I've been to Seattle. Mm, I know what the game day Seattle. atmosphere is like. There's no parking right there, but oh. there's there are a million bars and restaurants and, and places to just hang out and enjoy the pregame, and nobody seems to have a problem with the fact that there's not 8,000 grills per quarter mile throwing smoke in the air. I mean, every everybody's okay with, with the type of atmosphere that's there. Was that pack of reporters, I'm sorry, John, did, did that pack of reporters, did they try to – get out of Bedane, you know, where this will officially be located, or what's the holdup as far as an announcement? Um, he said they're still negotiating on things, so he didn't want to let anybody know, you know, exactly where they were at. Uh, like I said, it's 27,000 potential spots. He also made mention of the fact that there are 100,000 spots within three miles of the stadium site, and, and this is all for the most part in walking distance. Three miles is a little deep, but with the monorail and things like that, it, it wouldn't be too difficult. But, you know, I mean – Basically, his point of emphasis was there. There is ample parking that will be available for game day. Um, he, you know, that that that's something that everybody's wanted to address right off the bat. And I think he put that fire out as soon as the, the meeting got started. Well, a couple things, and you and you kind of lean me into what I want to talk about, Matt. And that is, again, throughout this whole process, I mean, there's been speed bumps. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you're building a almost $2 billion stadium, there's going to be some issues. But throughout all these meetings, they've tackled these issues one at a time, um, and they've moved around them. Um, the parking seems to be the biggest one right now. I think the other one that once they get the parking solved is going to be transportation, whether it's the monorail or whatever you know type of system they want to use. Um, but you were there. And I mean, we've been going to plenty of these meetings. I missed the one today. But still, I, I don't get the sense that – at any point, have the has the Raiders or have the Raiders gone off the rails here? There's there's been no, I mean, major red flags if that's the right way to phrase it, and that they they tackle the things that they need to tackle and move on. Right, there really haven't been any red flags. The problem is is that a lot of the outside media and a lot of the fans, uh, especially the the Oakland fans that still don't believe that this is actually going to happen, haven't seen something in front of them that says, oh, parking's here. Like this is where it's going to be. This is where you're going to tailgate, and everything's fine. And because they haven't seen that yet, they 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 have this idea that it's not actually going to happen. Mark Bedane and the Raiders have been working day in and day out to get this parking situation handled. They understand where everybody's at as far as their mentality goes. They realize that that people want to know as much as possible as soon as possible. And the parking issue has been the major issue for everybody outside of the project because. On site, you're only looking at 3,000 spaces. Um, he also mentioned, uh, or th the board mentioned as, as they were going through all the documents, that the Las Vegas Stadium Authority will have the, 
the availability of $7.5 million in funds to tap into if necessary to improve the parking situation. So if they if they go down the line and the parking situation is not quote unquote a first in line with a first class stadium, so basically on par with with the better stadiums in the NFL, then they can step in and tap into this seven and a half up to seven and a half million dollar resource to improve the parking situation. Nobody on the panel, nobody in the audience today assumes that that will ever happen because obviously the Raiders are going to do everything they can to make You'd hope sure. So. Right, and, and again, I'd have an issue working. if they had to step into that fund. But I mean, it's just like the the five million dollars set aside in case the stadium doesn't get built to 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 clean up the site, right? Right. And these are these are all these are all formalities because you have to have the in case stuff in the documents, you know, because you never know. I mean, there's 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 a there's a clause that lets them out if the if the whole building burns down. Right. I mean, there right. there are contingencies for for every single option. Uh, one other thing is, and I'm moving ahead here a little bit. You mentioned it, but I'm I'm I guess I'm concerned. You know, they're they're looking into it, but the monorail is the big thing for me because I know that I can park anywhere up and down the strip somewhere, right, and take the monorail into the stadium if I really don't want to deal with a walk. Um, I want to know where that stop is. I want to know if it's going to pull up right to the front uh, of the stadium. Is it going just to Mandalay Bay, and then mm-hmm. I'm still going to have to have a long walk? To me, that that's the, the biggest key to the whole thing. Um, well, I think Mandalay Bay is ideal if it goes to Mandalay Bay because they're going to build pedestrian bridges. I mean, there's already one that, that comes across right there on the, the north side of the stadium site. They plan on building one or two more, whether it's from Bally High or the south end of the Mandalay Bay. There are going to be access points, and it's no different. I've mentioned before, it's no different than the BART. Getting off the BART at the, at the Coliseum Station and walking across that bridge that takes you right to the entrance of, of the Coliseum in Oakland. I mean, it's, it's the same idea. So if that monorail pulls you up to Mandalay Bay, I think you're in good shape, especially if you get there early and you want to place a bet or go have a drink or what, you know, whatever the case is, you're right there in the casino to walk across. So mm-hmm. I think you'd be all right there. And what else happened today? Uh, so all of the documents were – were approved in form, they call it, which is basically now they need to, you know, it's all been approved, let's submit it, get it all done in writing and all of that good stuff. Um, but Dane was actually asked after the, after the meeting about um, how he feels, you know, his, his take on whether or not the owners are going to vote. We have a, his answer there. Owners have been, other owners have been kept knowledgeable about all these negotiations. How confident they'll prove everything on the 20th? Uh, I certainly don't want to make any predictions, but we've had tremendous conversations with members of uh, the league staff that then brief the finance committee. Uh, there are committee meetings next week, and hopefully we'll get some positive news coming out of that. And then there's a league meeting at the end of March where we get some final votes. And then the reason for the renewal options being removed from the, the renewal options, the city of authority said you guys requested removing those to extend yeah, it by wanna, the 20 years. I don't want to let the attorneys address that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's basically all of this needs to be done. They get to the owner's meeting. Um, he, like I said, can't speak for the owners, but they're pretty confident that the owners are going to okay this. Just like when it was okaying the move to come to Vegas, it was pretty much a, a unanimous vote minus what one, I think, uh, the Miami owner was, right. the, was, right. The, right. was the one naysayer. Um, also, last video here, but Dane had a little message uh, for the Vegas fans, just you know, kind of uh, letting them know how, how he feels about what's what's happening. To say to local NFL fans about getting to 2020. Uh, I, I, I hope they have a little bit of patience. Um, we don't. We would like it to be tomorrow, but uh, we have a lot of work to do. We're excited to see the stadium come out of the ground. We've opened our preview center, uh, and, the, and the local fan base has responded. I think they're enjoying seeing uh, what we built there and, and learn a little bit about the history of the Raiders. Uh, and as the seat product comes up for sale, we look forward to educating people on what their game day experience is going to be like. Thanks. Thank you. It was a little crowded there. It was hard to get a, a I'm going to give you shot, credit. So. And here's what, what you're doing, right? You're taking out a page out of my playbook, so I appreciate this. This makes <laughs> me feel good. Maddie's got his handheld microphone, right? But so many people, they just grab their iPhone and they think, oh, let me shoot the back of the head and think you're going to get great audio. It ta- takes a little bit of, you know, it, You know, it's a lot adeptness. of juggling and right. trying to reach in there and get the mic in the right so place. I see and so many things stuff, online so. where nobody uses proper audio. Uh, well, yeah, I could start listing names, but I guess I won't do that right now. Yeah. But at least you heard what he said. So, <laughs> it, was, it was a little packed, and we got a nice, you know, little. So side when we profile, were when so. we were there last time, right at the meeting, they uh, there's reporters all around him, but there's no one behind him on that angle, right? 
Well, so he, you have he a clear moved. Shot. He was. He didn't put himself in the corner gotcha. this time. Yeah. He, but you know where he sits every every. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He just stood up in his seat, and everybody kind of surrounded Man, him. So they need to have like an area now. You yeah, know, we need where a press can, conference set up, right? Yeah. 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 A little step and repeat with John's logo exactly. on it. Exactly. So the, the biggest sports adrenaline in Las Vegas. Yeah, I, I'd take that. Biggest takeaway from the meeting is full steam ahead. Uh, there, there really aren't going to be any hiccups here. Um, there were there were a couple a couple things that you know still needed to to get finalization on. Uh, they made mention of the fact that they haven't received in writing the Raiders' approval of the Ra- of or excuse me the NFL's approval of the Raiders moving, and they haven't received in writing the Raiders saying that they're actually going to move. But they did say, well, they've already put a hundred million dollars into the project of their own money, so that pretty much says they're going to move. So. Right. They just need a few more, you know, legal documents and, and all of that, and everything's going to be signed off on. Parking will not be an issue. Everything will be taken care of, and uh, Raiders are on their way. Yeah, twenty-seven thousand is a lot more than twenty-seven hundred or whatever right. it is. Yeah, exactly. uh, we've got some comments. Haley's not here, so you're going to subject yourself. Um, John's to drawings. Us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John's drawings. I like it. Uh, Cassius Ramsey or Casey Carpenter as. I know him by. Wonder <laughs> if they could add the five million for cleanup to the parking fund when they tap the seven and a half. Interesting. I would say I hope they don't park uh, tap the seven and a half. They're not as going we said. to. The Raiders right. are going to make sure that parking That's is. That's an interesting class. Uh, a point, though, Casey, because they are setting aside that five. But I think this is like money. In case it, it's more on paper, it's these more are very money, specific money funds on paper, and, right? Yeah, things like Correct. that. They have the money from the uh, RTC, right? Anyway, for transportation and mm-hmm. all that. Yeah, so maybe more coming out of that. Uh-huh. Um, I noticed we were all wearing dress shirts today. Um, this is abnormal. Yeah. And people are commenting about it. Got to stay classy. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we're Thanks, trying Jason. our best. Trying yeah. to class up the joint. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, I'm Haley trying to hopped keep up on with, from the holler parade. Uh, Haley's keep, right here, she says. <laughs> trying to keep up with John. So this course, is good. No Haley's time, out on the strip somewhere waiting for the hollers to drive by, and she's commenting for us. So, Haley, so holler, hey, holler, holler back. Yeah, holler, holler back. And then uh, Jason has a question. So who will have the bar for tailgating? If a doubtful, I, I don't know what that is, maybe there's a typo there. If the parking doesn't work out as we think, who will have the bar for tailgating? Look, I know it's a lot of speculation, and there's only 3,000 on-site spots and blah, 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 blah. There's going to be parking. They've, they've already made mention of the fact that they're, uh, the union, for example, is trying to, is trying to acquire certain land spaces to, to put parking spaces on and basically have a, a tailgate party, so to speak, of 700-plus spaces. Mm-hmm. And that's just one area. Parking's not going to be an issue, guys. It just because it's not out in front of you right now, and you haven't seen all the blueprints and all of the work that's being done behind the scenes, doesn't mean that it's not being worked on. There is no way that the Raiders are going to go into this new, nearly two billion dollar stadium and not have a place to put their fans. So, just it's going to happen. Don't next, worry. Next uh, next stadium authority meeting is what March fifteenth. March fifteenth will be the next one. Um, and then there were a couple tentative dates in case things aren't quite ready. I believe the 19th and the 22nd were the other two dates because they want to make sure that everything is signed off on for the owners' meetings at the end of the month so that they can come back in April and finish everything. And if you post a response or you have a question tonight, you're going to get John's emojis. I just see. I just yeah, see yeah, I know. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to keep up on social. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to keep up on your comments, too. While we're on the topic, uh, Patrick O'Donohue mm-hmm. should have put the stadium between South Point and the M. California people could have driven in and out. So many people wanted They didn't that. want to stay and clog up. Yeah, I still like this site. I yeah. like More this space site. there, but they wanted the strip corridor. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're staying on the strip, it, this is the most convenient absolutely. thing for you. And, and we've seen the impact, I think, personally, of T-Mobile, you know, compared to any other venue in the city, right, to mm-hmm. where, like, you, it's so convenient. You have so much foot traffic there. There's a lot of stuff going on. And with that little mall in the park, uh, I think everyone prospers from this, right? And I'd, ra- I'd rather appeal to the 300,000 or so that are in town just about every weekend in Las Vegas mm-hmm. than, that, than that traffic that's up and down uh, the 15. I right. Think, we, are, we all live here. We all have cars. We can get there. It's not a problem. Yeah. If, we want to make sure everybody else can get there. If it ever does get to the point, I mean, we know at first it's not going to happen, that this will be a tough ticket. But if it does go down the road where – there are seats available, you know, on a game day. At least we know that people are on the strip saying, oh, hey, Raiders are playing, uh, you know, the Niners Guys, or can, Raiders are playing whoever. Let's right. go down there and, and watch the game. Can we can we book hotel rooms? So I, let's why don't we book like for every Sunday in, in 2020 at Mandalay Bay? We don't know what the schedule How is. How far out do we have for to the, be? Yeah, well, a couple of years. We can, can cancel we do it those, now? right? Let's get on yeah. them, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. 
The book now pay, pay later. Yeah. Right? I, I don't know if you can. I, I'll look this up. I don't think you can schedule three years ahead. But <laughs> yeah. let me go ahead and try to look. Well, that thank up. you. Oh man, you are like Haley tonight. Look, yeah. look, everybody had a big issue with where T-Mobile was at and how bad the parking was going to be. And, right. And how bad is it really? Most people walk. You yeah. know, From hotels like uh, in that area, you're drawing yeah. fans from all it's over. It's nothing the world. new. People walk up and down the strip constantly. Yeah. Why? They is... walk three miles each direction. Their feet are killing them. I had somebody actually tell me on Twitter that walking across the bridge from Mandalay Bay to the stadium was not feasible because of how hot it is in the summer. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you guys. I've driven up and down the strip in July. There's usually people walking around. John so I is, don't uh, think it's an issue. John just signed on. He's trying to get tickets for uh, Ricky April, Martin in 2020. April 2019, you can uh, oh, uh, okay. book wait a, a room until. Right. Wait a little bit. We'll get yeah. there. So we'll wait. Let's, we'll get let's, uh, let's definitely do that. We'll have our own little suite, right, with us and about 200 guests up there mm-hmm. every week. Uh, the Raiders, so big day tomorrow, right? So the Raiders 49ers coin toss to see who wins the ninth overall pick in the upcoming draft. It happens tomorrow morning at 9.30 Pacific time. Live stream. Is there one? It's supposed to be. Or it might be on NFL, NFL Network. NFL Network. Yeah, yeah, right. They're doing it like in the weight room or something. But the, the thing that really struck me today was the Raiders are now favored to win. Minus 130, according to DSI Sports. <laughs> how could that be? How, how could that be? How can you well, have you a favorite? Well, you got to bet the other way. F- yeah. How can you have a favorite you, on a 50-50? Is this the Patrick 50? Ewing NBA draft? you got to bet the other way big like, time. Is the, what's wrong with the coin? we have a three-sided coin? coin? Whoa, like, uh, uh, where's that at? It's a D- DSI Sportsbook, so yeah. I guess it's uh, the it's, online. Sorry. It's got to be the most ridiculous you got to take the plus. Take the plus, yeah. Do they have a method of... Coin flipping that we're not. There might be like the Super Bowl flip where the guy just th- kind of tossed it and it didn't <laughs> flip, right? It cool. hit yeah. somebody's yeah. foot. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, it's, it it's doesn't make sense. Yeah, minus one thirty. I'm not going to be betting on that one. If yes. you're if you're betting on that, man, you've got issues. Uh, hey, this week John Gruden uh, he met the media before the combine, and he had a lot of comments. Uh, one thing that really stood out: Gruden on NFL analytics. He says, "Quote, man, I'm trying to bring the game back to 1998." as uh, Aerosmith's I Don't Want to Miss a Thing is playing in the background. And didn't the Broncos win the Super Bowl that the year? year he was hired by the Raiders, What Tony. is he it talking about? To Come on, man. It was, it was late 98. I do that Aerosmith reference in there. So. No, that's, I mean, he, what he means. you don't sing, I don't what It's usually that, Beyonce, so I'm just going back to 98. Mm-hmm. That's the year he became a Raider. And that's the, you know, let me bring it back to this, this, this power running, smash mouth, more of a West Coast offense style where... We're just going to beat you up at the line of scrimmage and then abuse you over the top when we have to. Yeah. And then on Amari Cooper, he says uh, he'll be the focal point of our pass offense. He's a gamer. He'll be the headliner in our offense. We know how talented Cooper is. We've seen it when he's been given the opportunity. Yeah, but he can't catch the ball because he's too big. He's not too he's big. Too he's strong. too strong. Terrell Owens too muscular. Was, was too big. Megatron was too big. Des Bryant's too big. I mean – that's right. That was a catch. And not, yeah, it was a catch. The, the NFL has since admitted that. <laughs> was that a catch? In, someone asked Good me morning. this week. Was Sorry, that a tangent. catch? Was that a catch in 1998? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably might, more so then. They might start going back in case probably, you hadn't seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pro- yeah. Probably more so then in '98 than it is. You today. know what? It was a fumble too. Damn it. <laughs> they did. Fumble. They ruled the Des Bryant catch. The the competition committee ruled the Des Bryant catch <laughs> or not catch most from 2014. A relevant thing ever. So we, in I case mean, you didn't catch take that, take the Niners plus plus. Plus money in the coin flip. Cooper, Cooper needs to be involved in the offense. He needs to be a focal point. And he needs to get the ball more. Uh, drops were an issue his rookie year. They weren't an issue his sophomore year. And his third year in the league, now another issue. But, again, I think he was dealing with injuries and he wasn't involved enough. Mm-hmm. Cooper needs to be a focal point. They need to get him the ball. He's one of the more explosive receivers. Um, great route runner. He, he needs to be more involved on a, on a week-to-week basis. The type of players uh, that they're looking for in the Raider organization, he says – we're looking for guys that are big, physical, fast, and have that profile. Uh, that won't change. It's something that we will live with uh, the Raiders. Hopefully, they will be a part of this franchise forever. Smash mouth, man. Yeah. He wants to beat you up He up wants front. to. He, he's really hell-bent on implementing an offense that has a fullback, right? Yeah. And how many times have I mentioned that with Marshawn Lynch and the way he was used this season? It was, it was single-back sets, coming out of the shotgun, going three wide, and you're trying to you're trying to smash Lynch into the middle with with no lead blocker. Mm-hmm. I understand you have a good offensive line. Well, why doesn't Carr pave the way? Well, can he block? Yeah, well, you know he doesn't want to get hit anymore. So I don't I don't think that's a good idea. But throw throw Alawale in front of him. Bring in bring in Elise Smith and put him at fullback because he can block. Put somebody in front of Lynch to clear the way. Again, I go back to to the days of, of Crockett and Wheatley. You put Zach Crockett in front of Tyrone Wheatley. You have 500 pounds of craziness running up through the middle 
scoring touchdowns. I mean, that's that's what you want to see with this this Lynch offense. Did he say Mike Allstott? Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. Cro- Crockett. Zach Allstott. Crockett. Did Zach I say Cro- Allstott? I said Zach Crockett. Not Allstott. Sorry, Stott. that's we the only said, fullback I remember. We said Mike Allstott. Brad I Muster. I remember Brad Muster. Zach uh, Crockett, yeah. man. Mm-hmm. John Ritchie. Yeah, we'll so, stay with the Raiders here. So uh, Gruden said that Lynch is still a beast. He still is a beast, and that he'd like that fullback. He says that fullbacks are a dying breed in football. And I didn't he know feels any, as though they're still around. He feels as though it gives your offense a lot of deception. So it, it, well, if, you're if, definitely if gonna, they can run the ball and uh-huh. they can catch the ball a little bit, absolutely. But well, you know, if it's just a big, just a big blocker. I mean, that kind of I don't know. In my opinion, I mean, I'll trust Chucky on this. Kind of defeats the purpose if you're a one-dimensional fullback and you, you're just there to block. No. I mean, it's a waste of a player in this in this era of the NFL. You already have the player there. Jameez Alawale is a very versatile back. They've mm-hmm. split him out wide numerous times over the last few years. Uh, if you remember two years ago, the game in Mexico City against Houston, Alawale split out, caught a pass, and broke for 70 yards for the go-ahead touchdown. I mean, that, that pretty much won the game for him. Right, maybe that's the next position he to has, evolve, just like the tight end yeah. has evolved. Well, uh, they use, the they use Mar- Marcel Reese like that, right. too, before mm-hmm. Alawale took over. Yeah. You know, you, you, gotta, you have a receiver, or I mean, a, a fullback that can essentially play like a receiver with more size, and, and that's what you get out of Alawale. Plus, he can block. He's a great blocking fullback. A comment here from Chris Wynn, uh, but I don't know if we're ready to move on here. But uh, no, Chris Wynn, love me some Chucky, but he's going to have to prove to me Raider, and Raiders fans he can coach in this era. Best case, he's a dick for meal. Playoff? Is it playoff? No, that's uh, no, that that's was... not. Oh shoot, for meal. No, the crier. Oh, for meal just that cries. Cry. Sorry, yeah. cry. Yeah. Well, okay. He's like so that girl on the Bachelor Vermeil, that always cries. Vermeil in '99. I had to get a Bachelor yeah. reference. Super Bowl, Super Bowl champion with the Rams, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's where you're going with, right? I think I think Gruden may be the most suited guy we've ever seen after a ten year layoff from coaching to come back and coach because of the position he was in. He was the analyst on Monday Night Football, which means he spent time every single week for ten seasons in everybody else's locker room. And nobody studies film like Gruden. He's a grinder. We've been over this. He grinds like nobody else. He's done nothing but study film from every single coach for 10 years. How about uh, Reggie McKenzie taking some shots at the media, saying that they're trying to trade everyone already or put them out, or, you know, put them on waivers? Uh, he said, we still want to have a team out there. They've, they've, got a, they've got a group of guys, for the most part, that went 12-4. and four. They were 12-3 and three before Carr broke his leg. The talent's there. They, mm-hmm. they were sorely misused in this system last year and, and we all know it. We saw we saw how poorly that offense was used. We saw the difference that Pagano made when he took over for Norton in that defensive scheme. The defense played phenomenal down the stretch compared to what they did early in the year. And all all Pagano did was change the way he moved guys around. He changed the scheme up a little bit. Talent is there. I think Gruden's going to get the most out of the talent, and this is going to be a winning team going forward. And he says that they need to build through the draft, and he said, uh, alluded to the recent drafts, uh, that saying only that Cooper really has panned out, has lived up to expectations. And so uh, he just wants Raiders for life. He wants players that he knows will be there for the long term, and he feels as though, I guess, uh, that they need to draft better. I think Mac has lived up to expectations. Okay. I yeah. think Carr has lived up to expectations. Well, Although we know, did have a down year this year. Do you know those guys? Were they still having a bromance, or you know him and Carr? I hope so. Okay. Yeah. He said he Keep loved them this week. Keep it you know, Fifteen times. E L E, man. Everybody love everybody. Yeah. And <laughs> and we talked about it on the podcast too about uh, Gruden on KMBR saying that this team, uh, since he left the first time, they've had ten different head coaches. And they've lacked consistency. Yeah. And that's a big part of building, you know, some sort of a, a, a major franchise. Jack Del Rio is the first, court, first coach since John Gruden back in the late 90s and early 2000s to make it three full seasons. Mm-hmm. That's it. And before Gruden, it was Art Shell in the L.A. days. I mean, that's, that's the only consistency you've had in the last, what, 30 years now. 30 years since 1988. Somewhere in that range, Art Shell, John Gruden, Jack Del Rio. And Jack only made it three full seasons. I mean, that's, that's not a good sign for your program. That's why there's been no consistent winning because you, just, you, have, you, have no, you have no consistency within the system. You can't keep guys in place. Uh, good question here from Jason. Uh, Jason Smith with Focus on Coop and the rumor of requesting a pay cut release of crab thoughts on possibilities of, of landry trade or preferred draft or free agent target if crab is let go 
I actually talked about this on the podcast this week. Um, that there there is talk of a Landry for Crabtree trade. There's mm-hmm. there's a, a big difference in money. I think so Landry's going to come in about double. Landry, right? They did franchise him, but the okay. the rumor is that they franchised him with the intent on trading him. Um, he makes about double what Crab makes. If if money ends up being an issue, I'm fine with Crabtree staying. I, I think Crabtree's a very reliable move the chains kind of receiver. He's great in the red zone. He runs that fade route as well as anybody uh, into the corner of the end zone. Um, and he's he's that third down guy for Derek Carr. But if you can make that deal happen and you can go get a guy like Landry, who's just you know younger, more explosive receiver, I'm all for that trade. Could I just give a shout out to Haley Brooks and her photo with J Lo? I'm so oh yeah yeah so jealous. Haley, <laughs> I um, had major FOMO. She moonlights at the uh, AXS Theater. Or That's the going Access to Theater, the Access, it is. Access yeah. Theater, which is yeah, going to become the Zappos I think she's Theater. Got three jobs. It's going to become the, th- yeah, the Zappos is, Theater. Yeah. Interesting. So anyway, she had have a photo any... of J Lo. Yeah, I know that was right. super. we should throw it up. On that was super. Yeah, maybe we should put that up there. Uh, any other comments there? No com. Oh, oh. no comments. Yeah. Oh, Chris uh, says E L E. He loves it. Okay. He stuff, knows man. what it's from. That's, that's, that's a movie line. Okay, He's got give that him one. an emoji. He's got that one. Chris, you know the movie. Throw it out there for us. You All right. Uh, let's uh, move along here uh, and talk it's about the knighthood. No. The knighthood? Oh, my favorite my yeah. favorite um, segment every week. Okay, Do so. Uh, all right, that's it. The knighthood. And uh, the Golden Knights uh, coming off of back-to-back losses. Don't get mad at me. I didn't play the game as they uh, <laughs> fell to the. Uh, what do you have to point it out for, Tony? They fell They're to the, the LA Kings. You know, uh, following Monday's NHL trade deadline. And before the deadline, VGK could not pull off that big deal uh, to land Ottawa's Eric Carlson. Uh, Pierre Dorian, the general manager of the Senators, said that it would have had taken a special deal to get that done. VGK, you know, I guess is going to probably make another run at Carlson this summer. But the Golden Knights acquired Thomas Tatar for first, second, and third round draft picks. Uh, The left winger has 16 goals, skated very well in his debut here a couple of nights ago, scored 25 goals a year ago, Uh, not a rental. Uh, I think, you know, the other players that were acquired, uh, Philip Holm from Vancouver in exchange for Brandon Leipzig, who they said Leipzig really uh, needed to be sent somewhere else so he could play. Actually, he didn't live up to his potential here. That's uh, the true story. And then uh, the trade for uh, uh, Ryan Reeves. Uh, Ryan brings some grit is what we heard McPhee say the other day. But does he bring too much grit? And someone got mad that I call him a goon. He's a goon. He's a goon. He's a, anyone, anyone that has two roughing penalties, or they both were roughing, right, in the third period. One was boarding. boarding. Okay, boarding. So Which roughing. is roughly yeah. the same thing. Yeah, Did you right. see <laughs> somebody posted, like, uh, this is what a dead body looks like. Yeah. He, you know, he hits the guy through the, well, you through know, the glass. But, no, go ahead. Okay, so, so two penalties, which kind of hurts momentum of the team. They're trying to rally back. They lose a game 4-1. to one. This is interesting because but I like a, the guy. It's I an, like the goon. It's a, it's I like a the debate, edge. and I, I just say. And, and is he a goon? Well, no, I'm not going to say that yet because it's can I say it? I'm not. Well, sure, you can. Okay, I like. You it. have your own. I mean, Tony has his own opinion. <laughs> isn't anyway. a goon? Anyway, isn't you know. a goon more though? Come out and just fight everybody. But he wants He's, to fight, but yeah. nobody wants to fight this guy. I don't know. There's a lot of chirping and a lot of kind of pushing, but the gloves never dropped. He never threw gloves down. Um. It's only two games in. I, I think let's let's let cooler heads prevail at this point. It's two games in. Team has to get used to him. He's got to get used to the team. Uh, I I didn't like the uh, not the I like the boarding hit. Um, and that I think that was a penalty. When you when you look back at it, the player's uh, back was a little bit turned towards the board. So and he, he launched. He, he was and he was he saying launched. you know he hit him in the chest. He actually didn't hit him in the, hit him in the chest. Maybe Nowhere maybe near. shoulder. It was that second penalty. I think it was on Dowdy that he that he kind of flew up his arm. And, and, and got roughing. That's not a hit you want to make with three minutes to go right. um, when you're down two goals. Right. Uh, I didn't like that one. I did like the boring one. Um, and actually, let's just kind of tee this up. We did get Ryan Reeves um, in the locker room after the game, and we can kind of react to this. But here's what he had to say after those two penalties after the Knights' four and loss to uh, the Kings. I don't think that penalty should be called in any decade. That's that's a clean hit. You know, it's not from behind. It's on his shoulder, if not even the chest. You know, just a loud noise that they're going to call the reaction of the bench. It's talking. Thank you, Brian. On your scoring chance, uh, you feel you had a pretty good look? Yeah, I thought, you know, he, he was kind of up high. He tipped it down. Um, he, he spun weird and it just kind of 
caught his skates. Uh, you know, it was a good play by him to, to cover his five while I thought I had him and made a good save. Brian, physical play we really haven't seen from this team, so you, you bring a different style. Do you think the Kings are aware of that and maybe came at you? It looked like at the times they were trying to instigate a little bit and take the Knights out of that their style of play. I mean, if you take those two penalties away, um, you know, I don't take penalties like that. I played against the Kings for seven years when I was in the West, and uh, you know, I play hard, and I think that's what's kind of kept me in this league is I don't take stupid penalties like that. So. Um, I'm not going to apologize for any one of those penalties. They, they did cost the game, but um, you know that's my style of play. I, I bring energy, I bring the physicality, and um, you know that's going to continue every every team we play. That's right. That's right. This comes from a guy that literally knows little to nothing about Ryan Reeves before he came to the Golden Knights. It's, it's two games. Let the guy establish himself. If he continues this kind of conduct, though, I, I, I see you know I, I see the point too where he just kind of doesn't fit into this team. Has this team needed physicality to become one of the best teams in the NHL? Not really. Do you need that in the playoffs? So I guess that remains to be seen. You saw playoff hockey. You saw playoff hockey in those two games against the Kings. To be fair, Reeves Reeves didn't cost them the game. He cost them the opportunity to get back into the game. Horrific turnovers cost the Knights the game. They were The first three goals that the Kings scored were just just horrendous. They they should have never had the puck in those Mm -hmm. situations. I think the problem with Reeves right now is he's trying too hard. He's, he knew he was brought over to be the physical guy. He knew he was brought over to make noise on that end. And he's, he's trying to do too much. Instead of just playing his game and playing within the Knights system, and when the opportunity is there to make a big hit, go ahead and take that opportunity, but don't force things. And it's only, you know, like you said, right. it's only two games. They should have won the first game. They were up 2 nothing with 9 to go. They were up 2-1 with 10 seconds to go. And then... A Riley Smith shot off the the crossbar that, if it was half an inch lower, goes in instead of pops out, would have won the game. So let's let's not overreact. It was an ugly game the other night because of the turnovers. It is only two games. They've played physical games before. And again, they're still 10 points above the next closest team in the Pacific. From this point forward, every single game is going to be a grinded out affair. And I think they're going to need him to be... Physical. I don't for ever everybody. say that. Well, that, it's going to get them ready for the playoffs, said Tony. I mean, well, it might take them a few games to This is exactly what they adjust, need to do. But right? every team in the NHL is going through this. Right. And, and we, we made mention of the fact that, that it's, the Knights are now you know, running into these types of games and it's slowing them down and they're not winning with the same regularity. But nobody is. Who's run away with the league right now? Tampa has 90 points. The Knights have 87. Uh, the, the Predators have 87. Nobody's running away from anybody. It's mm-hmm. not like the Knights have stumbled a little bit and everybody else has been on this winning streak and now they're 10, 12, 15 points behind. Everybody is still right in the same grouping. Uh, before we get to your next topic, Tony, let's go to William Carlson. Talk to him after Tuesday's game. And he had a lot of comments about Ryan Reeves um, and what he thought of his play so far. With Los Angeles. Um... No, but like we said here earlier, the, there were some emotions there on the ice. Um, and I mean, it's fun. It's fun when it's emotion and, and there's a battle there out on the ice. So uh, maybe in the future, we, there, there's more rivalry. When did you feel uh, a couple of the goals a little self-inflicted, just mistakes that you guys kind of made, put Max in some bad spots? Um, yeah. Yeah, we did. Um, just some bad bounces for us. Um, it happens. Um, we didn't uh, manage to find a way to get back. Reeves is out there yeah. making big hits, and then they're <clears throat> then retaliating, making big hits. Do you feel? Did it feel different out there with him out there? Kind of. Obviously, his his game is a little different than anybody else on this team. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to have someone with uh, physical uh, presence. Um, like I said, uh, I don't agree with the call he he got there in the first on the hit, but um, yeah, it's it's good to see him uh, stir things up and uh, especially. When it becomes a rivalry game like this, um, it's good to have. Do you like that kind of game? I mean, you're a skilled guy that, that probably prefers to to beat the team kind of with, with your skills. Do you do you like it to get into a game like that? Uh, yeah, I don't mind it. Um, I mean, uh, it's um, it's going to be tougher as the as the season uh, moves on. So I just just better get used to it, uh, and um, and I don't mind a lot of emotion. With a short time to get used to that new physical style of play, the trade deadline yesterday and two straight games, um, how quick do you got to make that transition to get used to the style of play has not been what 
we saw tonight from the Golden Knights. So does that disrupt a little bit the flow of what you try to do, what you've done, and what you've been successful with? Um, not really. I think, uh, speaking from my line, I think we're just going to try to keep going like we have. Um, we don't hit that much, I'd say. Um, and uh, just because a guy like Reeves comes in doesn't mean we're going to change. Um, he's going to do his thing, and we're going to do our thing. And uh, it's a good mix to have in a team. Thank you. So there you have it. Uh, and again, two games in, that's exactly what you're going to hear. Um, but you were saying uh, in in that little break, Matt, I mean, it, it's a valid point. I don't know who wants to steal it and, and sound really smart. But, Go for it. Um, a lot of guys didn't play. James Neal didn't play. Shea Theodore didn't play. Belmar still out. Um, you had Max, Max Legacy in net, who, who looked a, a lot more confident in the first 10 minutes of the game before those turnovers just went nuts uh, on the team. Hard to blame him. Right. Turnovers were bad, but he does average, what, four goals a game that he gives up or close to it, mm-hmm. three, six, somewhere in there. So when you get James Neal on the second line like he needs to be and Alex Tuck moves down to the third line to play with Tomas Tatar, who, as you said, skated really – he skated really well, and I thought he, he fit in very nicely – uh, on that third line, Belmar's got to be the guy on the fourth line. Um, really, yeah. I mean, he's the heart and soul of that line. And in a lot of ways, you can say he might be the heart and soul of this team. I mean, I, I love watching him play, and I love that fourth line out on the ice. So they still have a few injuries to get over, but I think um, don't hit the panic button and see how Reeves fits in until we actually get the rest of the starting crew back in. Flowers should be back in net tomorrow night against Ottawa. James Neal now listed as questionable. Oscar Lindbergh listed as out. For tomorrow night's game, it's the stretch run. It's March or so madness. There we go. I mean, this is this last month of the season. They don't. They they have no a, comment. No comment on March or so no, madness. No, I, I mean, like he's it. We're the best good player on the now. team. Him yeah. and Perron, right? Yeah, and, that and, first line has been excellent. I, I, I don't know what other Smith. I don't know what other top line out there. Again, I, I really am kind of glued to the Knights. But what other top line out there? Sure, you may have better scores. What other top line has done a better job than the Golden Knights this season? No. no. Carlson and and Marceau and Smith are the the, the best line in the right. NHL. Plus minus wise, right. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and Riley Smith said this past week. Every time he passes the puck to Marceau, to Carlson, Carlson, uh, they, they score. They yeah. score. He said it's so easy to just set them up because they're always going to score. So Tony, I'm going to turn this on you. You got Ottawa tomorrow. Ottawa. Ottawa. And then you have a a five game roadie. Yep. The Devils. The Devil game scares me. Blue Jackets. They're starting to play better. Okay. Red Wings. Yeah. Sabers. Yeah. Flyers. How many points out of a possible ten? Not the not the toughest road trip. They've had much tougher road trips. Mm. You have a lot of teams Six. that are that are trading pieces away Six. as of last week, and Six. you know not kind if of they're lucky. Six. At the bottom. If they're lucky. Over so under will three be and five two and a half. Is, is best. Over under is five and a two, uh, five and a half. I'm saying I'm saying four and one. Okay. Well, good at luck worst there. at worst three one and one. I say seven or eight points on this trip. Three and two. They're going to lose to the Devils. Devils playing better, I think. Uh, let's move on. Let's move on, guys. <laughs> Can we talk uh, you and I? Oh, yeah. Rebels? Hey, I'm really excited to talk about running Rebel basketball, which no, I'm not. James Neal and um, Brian Reeves were together at the game. Um, and that was nice to see. They got a nice in uniform. And people were calling for Reeves to get out on the court and deck somebody on the Reno basketball team. So, Neal's wrist looked okay. Yeah, Same. no splint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Rebels manhandled by UNR. If yeah, you haven't heard point. yet, yep. If you haven't, one hundred and one to seventy-five uh, for the running Rebels. They've just gone into a major slump. They haven't won now in almost three weeks, and I don't know if they're going to win at Utah State on Saturday night. And we were right in our podcast a couple of weeks ago, where we said this team could really be stuck at nineteen. Uh, nineteen wins for the season. The difference last night, you know, when I went back and started reflecting. The difference between the first meeting and this meeting last night, uh, one of the major differences, there are a lot of differences. Well, uh, in, the first, in the first meeting, Reno would go on runs, UNLV would counter back and forth. A run right. of 8 nothing, 8 nothing, 10-2, 12-2. A lot of fun two. to watch. Like, fun to watch, back and forth. Last night, the running Rebels had absolutely no answer. They didn't do a good job defensively. And they didn't shoot well in this game. I mean, uh, four of 23 from distance, including a key three-pointer from Jordan Johnson (laughs) to win over the student body and get free Raising Cane's chicken. Uh, But JoJo Mooring, two of 16 from the floor. He's hit or miss. He's hot or cold. What do you mean he's hit or miss? 
I mean, well, he scored 31 as, in the right, first as meeting. in hit, as in jump into other defenders that yeah. he lays out hits. But that's a, I, I just it's terrible. Man, I mean, it's I'm it's sure horrible to watch. I'm sure he's play. a good kid. I blame the I just, officials. But we're for talking the, about I, I, on I blame the, the court, officials yeah. for the loss last mm-hmm. night. I blame the officials. Oh, yeah, they were clearly affecting the game. No, you can't. You can't come out and consistently go two for fifteen, three for sixteen. His numbers are are just. Horrible, and he he led the team in minutes last night. He didn't really give you much. Uh, again, I think he only hit two field goals last night. I mean, zero for seven from three. He takes he takes terrible shots. He's out of control most of the time, and he's not in the flow he's of just, the game. Right? He's just not a good shooter. Just, he does get hot. Everybody gets hot. I've played basketball enough to to have a hot streak and make three, four, five, six in a row. That's what kind of shooter he is. He's not a consistent shooter. Not consistent enough to try to carry a team. But, I mean, it's obvious. In, the, in this scenario, I mean, just a footnote on how the way that the, the Rebels play today. Defensive intensity just stands out more than anything. Not they existent. Bring it, they bring it four minutes. Four minutes into the fr- – sorry, so, I'm getting fired up. Because yeah. it's, it's tough to watch this basketball team play. What was the and score? 16-minute mark right. of the first half? They were up 10-7. Then it was down. What was it? Twenty four. Twenty. I think it was a twenty eight to four run four from run. there. Yeah, uh, that's a, inexcusable. Yeah, it's it's disgusting. And I'll try to I'll just try to keep it down. But I, I just don't <laughs> know. I mean, where's the moxie from this team? Where where is it? Here's here's the most disturbing part about what yeah. you're talking about. This isn't a one off. They were blown out against San yeah. Diego State, and that's when they were playing their best basketball coming into that game. They didn't even show up for that game. It was wire to wire. Mm-hmm. San Diego State beat them. Then they were blown out at home against Fresno State. Ended up only being a 13-point game, but they weren't even. Was they were never close? in that it was game. Was not that close. Then they played hard offensively. They they made shots. We'll say okay. against New Mexico, but defense was non-existent. New Mexico shot 50 percent from three, and then again another no show. At home against Reno. Not to yeah. mention, this is what five conference losses in a bad Mountain West conference at home. Come on, guys. And the fanboys will not stop with with fouls. No, seriously, guys, it's got to end. Fouls man. are irrelevant. It's just people complaining about fouls. And JoJo Mooring, let me tell you one thing: he plays out of control. He tries to draw a foul rather than trying to make the bucket. Right. That's what he did. How many free throws did they shoot against in Mexico? 40, 40. 40 free throws. They missed 12. But the it was, it was the refs that cost them that right. game. They shot 40 on the road in the pit. Right. Come on. And they missed 12. The game should have been out of reach there. They should have won yeah. by double digits in that game. That's uh, Important note, uh, after the first half, I sat in front of my laptop and started doing homework. <laughs> um, I didn't want to watch. I started at the 16-minute mark. Yeah. Yeah. John jumped back in around the four minute mark. Yeah, and, what so happened? what I missed? Who's winning? Yeah. Hey, what Nothing. was that play? Yeah, yeah. he yeah. heard the fans. Well, so they did he, a good job marketing. You know, the students. So yeah, we had some great, fans. It was a good crowd. It was a good crowd. Yeah, I, I was surprising to me to be a four, uh, fourteen ish, thirteen ish. I, I don't know if they're that many. Relatively, it was above. They 10. were close to four thousand students. So it shows me one thing: they marketed very well to the students. They need to do that same marketing approach with fans that the are problem spending is, the I money. Don't, I don't think the students care. Outside of San Diego State and Reno, I don't think they care to show up because oh, we beat Air Force. Nobody cares. Oh, we beat San Diego State. Nobody cares. I think some would come back next season, Uh unless they graduate or unless they they leave early with McCoy. Some kind of products on the floor. So one game Saturday, Saturday, one game to fix things. Lost. (laughs) They're gonna lose. Oh, it's a tough, it's a tough trip. They already Already lost at home. Already Already lost at home to you. Oh, minutes. No, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. we can't fly into uh, Logan, Utah, right? So let's now make an excuse and say that it's the travel when everyone else has to travel. So you have to fly into Salt Lake City and then drive, and it could be bad, inclement weather, what have you, an hour and a half to get up to Logan. It's a long travel day. No excuses, guys. It's like everyone else plays this schedule. They made that excuse going to Fresno. That's what, an hour and a half flight? Who are you talking still- to? Who's making these excuses? Fanboys? Yeah. It's, it's, it's an hour You're and a like half, maybe, word, right? flight. It's, <laughs> it's still on the West Coast. You didn't have a time change. And you, you flew. You didn't have to jog yeah. there. You're fine. Right. You're fine. It's, there's no excuses. The team's not playing good basketball on either end of the floor. That's, that's the bottom line. And they're, they're going to lose against Utah State. They're going to be in that play-in game going into the tournament. And it could and be Colorado State or Air Force, and they could play at 11 o'clock in the morning. Both teams, both teams they should beat. Let's be honest. They should beat both of those teams. 
I just don't know that they will if they what can't do they have get to do a to play? I'd, I'd much rather play Colorado State. What do they have to do? Do they have to win that game to play them? Who knows? I, I haven't. Right. Nobody even cares. Out. I mean, I, th- I know they need a win to get the seven seed. I think that's yeah. what it is. Mm-hmm. If they win, this is a team seed, that was the number the three game. seed two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But they haven't won since. They have not won since, mm-hmm. and they've been blown out of three of the four losses. Yeah. Uh, last night, uh, Shakur Houston, 14-14. and 14. We have to make a case. He definitely is the first team Mountain West Conference selection. Yep. Has to be. McCoy, 19-17. Yeah. and 17, And that was kind of quiet, I thought. You yeah. know? Yeah. It was a Absolutely. quiet 19-17. and 17. But Caleb Martin makes a world of difference with Reno. Uh, scored 19 points. And then his brother Cody's playing the point. And he schooled the Rebels last night. They're trying to wind down the clock. The lane is wide open. So he just takes it, takes it, takes it. Just run by guys. Twenty six points. The defense was non existent. There was a there I'm was getting a, as fired up as you, John. There was a moment where his brother was who torched the rebels, especially in the first half, was and this was in the first half when he was going crazy, had the ball at the three point line. Jordan or uh, um Javon Mooring is is supposed to be on him, mm-hmm. and Mooring ran right past him to somebody else nice. who wasn't even in the play. <laughs> He ran right past oh. the man with the ball to go cover somebody else, to double-team somebody else and leave the best player on the floor with the ball by himself. That's just, that's just not understanding how to play defense. Fans, if you're tuning in, uh, definitely leave some comments. You might get a John emoji on our Facebook page tonight. Uh, and I wanted to throw this out there. Uh, if you're tuning in right now, you know, give us your comments as well. But, guys, I don't know if you saw the news today. But uh, San Diego uh, reports today out of San Diego said that the conference has been talking to BYU and to Gonzaga Mm. about joining the conference. Bring them. So rejoining for BYU and then Gonzaga would be that'll lift up the profile. UNLV needs that BYU rivalry back. That was that was one of the best rivalries I've been around during my time around this program, which has been my whole life. I mean, that 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 rival was unmatched when they were in the Mountain West Conference. And Gonzaga's a, a perennial yeah, and, top and 25 team. Yeah, and I think you team. need, you know, and, and this is not to, to puff up UNLV because, uh, sorry, I could go into a tangent. But we need <laughs> we need more elite programs, you know. Mm-hmm. UNLV is not elite right now. We know that. The name's elite, and it still is elite, and people look at it that way, and the players treat it like it's elite. And the other teams in the conference treat UNLV like an elite program, and they always bring their, you know, their top game against the Rebels. We need more teams like that, so not every team is – is looking at UNLV on the schedule and saying, oh, yeah, we got to beat the Rebels. Um, so UNLV gets up for that BYU game because it's a huge rivalry. UNLV gets up to play Gonzaga because that's a perennial powerhouse now. Mm-hmm. So we need more teams like that. I think it'd be excellent. I, I don't think there'd be anybody out there with, that would disagree with that. No. Reno had its way also with the Lady Rebels. They lost by 20 points yeah. on Tuesday night. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Tough back-to-back uh, losses for UNLV's basketball programs. Uh, UNLV football. Did you guys? Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, sorry. We just have a couple comments. Chris, Chris Wynn, right? Embarrassing. We know that. Absolutely. Somehow this team has managed to get worse as the season has progressed. Nail, head, bang. Uh, Jason Smith, 30 <laughs> point losses, right? SMH might as well put just put El Dorado's team on the court. Uh, they play harder. And then what about uh, Tiffany Biggs? Oh, yeah. Uh, she loves uh, William Carlson's beanie. I bet you that's not the only thing that she likes about William Carlson. Ah, oh, they love those Swedes, uh, don't they? But she, <laughs> yeah, no, no, actually, she probably she's probably like rolling her eyes that I said that. She doesn't make those comments. She loves me. More than um, it's, it's great. Thanks, honey. So let me make sure. So I'm looking at the UNLV football schedule released today. And let me see if I know what all of these logos are. So September 1st at USC. Mm-hmm. We know that. Uh, then they come back home. They host UTEP and then uh, Prairie View A&M, which originally I thought that Grambling was supposed to be on the schedule, but that didn't pan out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they're at Arkansas State, three and three and one uh, if things fall Come the on. right way. But oh, Arkansas God. State's tough. Come on, Arkansas State's tough. Their quarterback's coming back. I watched them play last season. That was a bowl team, and playing there on the road's going to be tough. So they could be two and two. But then they've got. Uh, the Lobos, is that a Lobo? Yeah, they've got the uh, the Lobos here at home in October at Utah State. They play Air Force at home. You know, no Boise on the schedule. They play at San Jose State. They host Fresno State. This is a manageable schedule. Yeah. And then the final three games are uh, two out of three on the road at San Diego State, at Hawaii, back home for Reno. No reason why this team should not win six games minimum this season. They've got to be six and six. They have to be. Why? 
Because no, 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 even, no, no, no. Because I think they've improved in very, <laughs> yeah, in, in a lot of areas. Uh-huh. Even even if the new uh, skipper, the new defensive coordinator, uh, isn't the greatest thing since uh, sliced bread, I just think the change is going to help them out on the defensive end of the uh, of the football. Plus, plus on offense, you've got so many skill players, and and you've had uh, a good recruiting year where. You just have increased all the depth on this team. I'm willing to bet that if we go back 365 days to our show last year I when said, the schedule I said, came I said out, seven, we I said would seven probably wins. hear the same kind of thing. And what happened? I said 25 what wins happened? for the basketball team. They came right out and laid an egg instantly. This And look, I, I want to see a 3-1 and one start. I want to see a bowl-eligible team. I want to see this program move up to a, a different level than what they've been throughout their entire existence. But until they actually do it on the field, there is no way in hell I'm going to look at this schedule and go three and one out of the gate, maybe two and two. Three and one. I see L, 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 L all the way down until they prove otherwise because this team cannot beat Division two schools. This team cannot beat teams that have two wins on the entire season. I'm not going to use to lose to UTEP because UTEP's anything. rebuilding. They had 15 coaches last year. They're not going to lose to Prairie View A&M. They won't. Are they going to lose to a two-win BYU team that hadn't beaten anybody coming into the to Sam Boyd? They did that already. Exactly. <laughs> Are they going to lose to another <laughs> FCS team coming in? They, they did got that already. Out of the way, Matty. Yeah. Oh, by the I, way, I, I yeah, mean, I saw it. it's a Panther for Prairie View. I'm trying to. It's just the uh, the logos and the icons there. So I'm like, what is this thing there? So Arkansas State. Uh, anyway, Tony Sanchez made an appearance on the Rebel Report today, the, oh. the student run show that we did. He nice. always comes down and does an interview with us, which is always great. And he's always upbeat and, and happy. Spring uh, ball. I'm sure you're going to note Tony starts next week. So, you know, I, I mean, it, we asked him, you know, is this year for a bowl game? You know, it's got to mm-hmm. be. I, I mean, and, you know, of course he's going to say it this way. And, and it is true to a, to a certain extent, right? This team has gotten better as he's been here at UNLV record-wise. Now, is this the turning point? And, and I look at the schedule on paper, Matt. I, I'm with you to a certain extent. I'm with Tony to a certain extent. On paper, this is a bowl team right now. Very manageable, very favorable schedule for UNLV. Rebel Baseball, 8-1 and one now after they won at Riverside. And on Friday, they open up a series at home against Fresno State. So it's a nice start. And I saw uh, some national recognition as this is one of the early surprises in college baseball. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's going to be, you know, the clubhouse has to be playing a, a role in that. Not a great season last year. I think it was the end of the year that they really uh, kind of took a nosedive, mm-hmm. uh, the baseball team. So it's nice to see a, a very solid start. Uh, to a season. Stan Stolte, one of, I think, two head coaches that didn't receive a, a contract extension mm-hmm. when Desiree Reed francois came in. So he's uh, he's doing a nice job turning turn the team around this season. And speaking of baseball, we attended the groundbreaking for the Las Vegas 51's new stadium on a frigid day in Summerlin last Friday. Uh, frigid, yes. We saw the snow coming. We, we did. I was guys, there. You guys Man. saw the we snow. Were, yeah, we were I, stuck I in the snow. Yeah. Matt was ready to throw snowballs at me. John and I were standing out there after you had retreated to the tent and went and hid in the warmth, and we're looking at the Red Rock Mountain, and we're going, this this is coming. This snow is going to hit us sooner than later. And Man, it was cold. Yeah, yeah, it was event. cold. Uh, they had a blasting. Uh, I talked with a friend of mine that works over at City National. Uh, they did not know what was happening at City National because it's right next door. So they kind of they blew up the ground a little bit, and people freaked out at they, City National. They call that there was they, no warning. Thought it was an yeah, they call that yeah. an icebreaker. Yeah, icebreaker. Yeah, yeah. there you go. And so maybe, maybe the ice shattered. Cra- yeah. Cracks yeah. in the ice after that. But it was a great event. I mean, we won't belabor this. The fifty ones. Uh, if any team has earned uh, a new facility, it's the Las Vegas fifty ones. Can't wait. It's going to be ready in one year for the 2019 um, season. And I want to just go ahead and hop into this because uh, I got Rossi Rallencotter, the head of the LVCVA, to talk about uh, a lot of things, and, and that's basically, you know, why they put their money into this. Um, and I think there's a great reasoning behind, you know, it, 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 a lot of people saying that, that funding excessive, um, the $80 million that they're chipping in, but here he is speaking as to why. All right, before we freeze, you know, a big day. I mean, Rossi, I, I know we've been waiting for this for a long time. Just can you kind of give us a sense of just how much force it took to finally get this project underway here? Well, it, you know, we've had uh, over 30 years uh, with the Las Vegas 51s, originally the Stars, and we've been a great minor league uh, team here. Uh, we're an uh, important part of the brands of the Pacific Coast League, so this gives us an opportunity to expand that. Uh, with the sports renaissance is going on in the community right now, another great addition. Uh, this will give us the ability to host winter baseball meetings, more ma- big league weekend games, 
Uh, quality of the baseball. The AAA guys are one step away from uh, Major League Baseball. So, it's, again, it's a community thing. Be a lot of community outreach. This new I RBI program that uh, they have now with Major League Baseball for inner city children. And so it's, this is just something that's going to be a, a great family activity. Have you run some numbers yet, or do you have anything, any estimates as far as when this thing is built, how many more, you know, room nights or whatever analytics you guys use to, to kind of calculate how this will attract more people? Well, if we uh, add some more uh, Big league weekend games. That'll that'll add probably uh, 35, 4,000 uh, uh, room nights for that activity itself. But with those other other NC2A activities and so forth, that it can add to the room nights uh, uh, that are generated uh, uh, every day in Las Vegas. And so as we add more rooms, there's going to be another 10,000 rooms over the next probably six, seven years. So this gives us an opportunity to bring some more people in for another activity in the best place in, in the world, which is Las Vegas. Last question, and you know, if anybody has deserved a, a new stadium, it's the 51s with their tenure out here. A lot of people, of course, talking about the sponsorship deal, but I'd like to just ask you the angle of Cashman Field. I mean, that was sucking money out of you guys for a while. So, I, I mean, money-wise, this isn't a, a loss at all for the LVCVA, or can you kind of characterize it? Putting money into a new ballpark is much smarter than putting money into an old ball. Well, a couple things. You look at a renovation that, but the uh, opportunity for the city of Las Vegas to get the 52 acres that are down there for redevelopment. That was a win-win for them. Uh, they, they, us um, now transferring the operation of the cost of doing all the ballpark stuff uh, to the 51s and Howard Hughes, that was uh, enables us to have more money for our uh, renovation and, and our expansion. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, we were state-of-the-art when Las Vegas, when, when the ballpark was first built. Uh, now we're going to be state-of-the-art again, and then by calling it the Las Vegas Ballpark, we'll be able to advertise Laughlin and Mesquite, the outlying areas which we want to do, bring in the Major League teams for Big League Weekend. So it has an impact across the board for all of us. Oh, yeah, I will. Uh, <laughs> I think it told him to head inside and get warm. You could actually hear how cold it was, strangely enough. But, but Rossi's saying it there. I don't know. I mean, people arguing this, I get it's a big number, but I don't think they have a, le a leg to stand on when you look at the numbers and the money that the, the LVCVA was losing, putting it into Cashman Field. Yeah. Now the lights get it. Um, the 51s are taken care of. Everybody's happy. I, th I think it's, a, again, a win-win. I said uh, a new 51s baseball stadium would be built when Vegas freezes over, and Vegas did freeze over. It last week. certainly did. Definitely did. We saw James Loney out there former 51s player, major league uh, player, and uh, Shane Victorino mm -hmm. uh, was out there as well, along with several luminaries, including John Castanino. Uh, Thank you. Hey, the transition to the Las Vegas Lights, did you see they flipped the field uh, now so it's ready for baseball? Mm -hmm. So we saw it for soccer where they put all the grass out there and they laid it out, and now it's uh, turned back as we get ready for the 51s for big league weekend. So the way they're going to do that, the, so the sod that they laid down originally – is going to be discarded that because roots are going to take in that amount of time and they're going to get rid of that the sod they lay down next on their next homestand is going to be rolled up after the the homestand is over they're going to roll that up they're going to store it out behind center field and use that throughout the course of the season as long as it is usable so um i think he said it's a uh, about a, you know 24 to 48 hour process to to go through that whole thing but you know they're just going to keep reusing it until they, they can't reuse it anymore so the Lights lost at home Saturday night, lost to D.C. United of the MLS. We've known that uh, in the exhibition season that these MLS teams, uh, Matt was pointing it out uh, if you listen to our podcast, and just how much bigger, stronger, faster uh, the players are, uh, you know, in the MLS. So once uh, the USL uh, season begins, then you're going to see uh, teams that are comparable uh, to Las Vegas. Head coach Chalice told reporters afterwards uh, not to write anything good because his team said a played few things. poorly. Uh, yes, he, he said you could put the little poo emoji on there. Uh, but, yeah, uh, for the, the black and red, Paul Areola uh, finished the match with three assists and uh, 24,000 total fans for three dates for the lights. And those were three of the coldest nights, you know, that, that we've encountered here. You know, uh, we, we thought the weather was breaking, right? It was nice, and then it got cold. It made that turn right when they started the exhibition season. So once the weather gets nice, man, they're going to average. They'll get 10,000 out there easily. Yeah, I, I think I think, I think, think their average this season is going to be right around that 7,500 mark. I think, that's, I think that's a really good goal to shoot for. Obviously, they want to be sold out every single game. Uh, that might be 
too high of an expectation. But I think anything in that 7,500 7, range and, and beyond is, is going to be good for this team. March 17th at Fresno, that's the start of the season. Next weekend, they're playing a couple of uh, friendlies against USL opponents uh, down in Southern California, so that ought to be good. Uh, boxing news. Uh, we've got a couple of fights. There's one on Showtime, and there's one on HBO this Saturday night. WBC uh, heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder uh, will be taking on Luis Ortiz. Uh, it's a battle of undefeated. It's Wilder 39-0, 38 KOs. Ortiz 28-0, 24 knockouts, and that will be on Showtime. And uh, Ortiz said that Wilder looked scared. He looked a little, like, off in the uh, the stare down. Did you see? He looked a little intimidated. We'll have to see if something uh, plays out there. I don't know there. about that. And then uh, you can comment also, I guess, uh, Sergey Kovalov is back in the ring on HBO against uh, some tomato can, uh, Igor Milkalkin. Milkalkin? Something. Macaulay Culkin? Yeah, Macaulay Culkin. And then Cyborg's uh, at UFC at T-Mobile. Any thoughts on any of those fights? I, you know, I, I've been preaching it for how long now? I just want to see Wilder and Joshua get through their next opponent so that we can finally get that fight going. Um, I, I think Wilder Macaulay wins Culkin. this. Macaulay I think Wilder fighting. wins this. <laughs> I think Wilder wins this fight. Um, Joshua will probably win his fight. These are the two best heavyweights out there. Um, I mean, you've got, you've got two guys here in, in Ortiz and Wilder who do nothing but knock people out. But you've got to give the edge to Wilder there. His, his power's ridiculous. He's got four inches on the guy he has a ton of reach on him um and he's you know he's he's the marquee guy out there along with joshua so just give me that fight man just just get to those two guys and let's not have any speed bumps and let's make sure that that thing happens on uh sunday we'll all be out at the uh j-lo 300 isn't it the j-lo 300 out at uh, i think that's what oh, Marshall? That. las vegas motor speedway no that's just the photo reference with Haley and J-Lo. Since she's not here, we got to give her shout-outs. I'm not sure our audience comments. got that. I apologize. It's okay. I'm not sure anyone got mm -hmm. that. But yeah. uh, So NASCAR is coming into town. It is. I'm excited. I love I NASCAR wait. weekend. We'll all I be do. there. I, yeah. And I don't think about it much because this weekend's chaos. You mentioned rugby, um, the Golden Knights. I mean, everything's happening. But NASCAR weekend really is one of my favorite weekends. And first time ever, triple header. We got racing tomorrow. Truck series. Truck series. Then yeah. uh, I, I, I believe it's truck series and qualifying, um, if I'm not mistaken. Truck mm -hmm. series and qualifying for Sunday's race. And then Saturday, um, the Xfinity Series race, which Kyle Busch will be running in. And then Sunday's the, the, the big tomato. I'm looking forward to it. I love. I, I go out. We go there. from the tomato yeah. can to the tomato. There you go. I try to get out there every year. My son loves going <clears> out there. It's. We mentioned it when we were out there earlier in the in the year. The 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 color, the pageantry, the excitement, the flyover, everything that goes with it, the the sound. It's it's just it, it's it's a lot of fun to be in that atmosphere. Uh, it doesn't translate on TV, and and you know we've heard the same arguments about hockey over the course of the years that it's it's a live game. You have to be there live. And it is amazing live. But I think racing is a lot like that. You, you want to be there live and kind of experience the whole thing and really feel the energy. So, Matt, you brought tonight show and tell for us. Uh, <laughs> Outlaws jersey. Uh, Greg Anthony throw, throwback. Yeah. Uh, Clint Malarchuk's jersey over there. I wish it was Malarchuk's okay. jersey. <laughs> Uh, Kevin McReynolds. Kevin McReynolds. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some great names, man. Crocky, uh, Anybody Crocky familiar D. with Las Vegas? Yeah, we need a Alamar, right? history. Yeah. There it is. He, he hate me over there. We got, he hate me, Anthony, yeah. Larchuk, and McReynolds, man. Those are some. Those are some great names in, in Las Vegas sports history. I like that. Uh, a couple of comments before we get out of here. Uh, Jason says he might actually watch a McCauley fight or McCauley. Uh, Chris Quinn, hey, he's a big fan of us. He said I was sweating bullets talking about Sanchez. No, I'm actually sweating because I'm wearing a sport coat, and there's been a lot of lights. Yeah, the, the so lights are on tonight. I'm a, little, I'm, a little, uh, I'm a little glossy, apparently. It's shining through. You should camera. have borrowed some of Strasser's makeup. Um, hey, and, and for those betting folks out there, I'm backtracking a hair. Um, oh, shoot. Of course, it just logged me out. Uh, betting for the, the Pennzoil 400, Logano 10 to 1. Um, there was a couple other guys that really like, oh, Logano 10 to 1, Jimmy Johnson 10 to 1. Not a good start so far this season. Denny Hamlin 15 to 1, uh, Eric Jones 20 to 1. Those are four names that I like on the list. Um, it is uh, what Kevin about Harvick. Keselowski's got to be a favorite. Keselowski, right? uh, number what about two Kurt favorite, Bush? Harvick. Number one on the list. Harvick's the, the odds-on favorite right now. Keselowski right behind him at four and a half to one. Uh, Kyle Busch, 
six to one. Kurt Busch fifteen to one. Look, I recall, fifteen to one. Yeah, fifteen to one. Nice. I, I wouldn't put it on Kurt. I put it on Kyle if I was going. I'm going to go with. With, I'm gonna go with Kurt. But I like I like um, Logano. He's always fast in Vegas, and I like Jimmy Johnson at ten to one. I think that's great value. Good value there. Yeah. Let's do our final thoughts, guys. We've gone a little bit over, but a lot of sports activities going on this weekend. That We're busy. We're busy. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on something we talked about earlier because this is what I wanted to hit on and it's it's real simple. If the ball is in your hands and you get two feet down, it's a catch. It's also a football move. I know the NFL is going over the rules now and saying what was a catch, what wasn't a catch. Anything that happens on a football field is a football move. You're playing football. If you catch the ball in your hands and two feet are down, anything after that is irrelevant. If you lose the ball after that. That's called a fumble. That's not, that's not surviving the ground or whatever ridiculous lingo they can come up with. That's a fumble. Catch the ball, two feet down. Everything else after that is just part of the, the play. It's a, it's a fumble if you lose it. If you go down to the ground, you better hang on to it. Simple as that. John? I just Sorry, I just read this because I usually figure out my final thoughts right before the final thoughts. <laughs> Sean Miller back on the floor. 30-second standing ovation Thursday. First game since the pay-for-play scheme. Uh, I, I mean, I could take this in any number of ways, but I'll keep it local. Uh, final thoughts. Just the runner Rebels. I mean, panic button. Now, I think you hit the panic button. I think you hit the panic button. Some people have already panicked. Other people say, all right, well, we still got to feel this thing out. I mean, I, I'm kind of speechless with where this program's at. I understand Matt's argument about, you know, you got to stick with Marvin Menzies at this point. Do you have to stick with Marvin Menzies at this point? And the whispers are, are starting, you know, and, and, and I'm not – weighing in either way here, but the whispers are already starting with, with Rebel fans. Is Menzies the guy? Um, do we need to think about another head coach right now? And for me, I guess, I don't know. I, I, I haven't liked the way this team has been coached this season. I'll just say that. Uh, and I just go straight to intensity. This team does not play hard. And I've heard Marvin Menzies come out and say, it's a bad scout, not it's a lack of effort. And, and it's kind of stunning to me. Um, so, I mean... <laughs> I wouldn't put my money, certainly, on them catching fire uh, to win the conference tournament. It's an early exit for UNLV basketball, and we reset for next season. Panic button now. Golden Knights tearing it up. You have even the lights drawing 10,000 fans here. Granted, that's a, that's a different crowd than maybe a run and rebel game. The Las Vegas Aces there's, Aces, there's too much going on in Las Vegas now for people to be tied to run and rebel basketball anymore. Change, change needs to happen. No, oh, excuse me. Change needs to happen quickly. Very quickly, as in early next season, if you have any hope of recapturing uh, the city. Thank you, John. And uh, Coach Menzies last night uh, looked like he was all out of friends. And on the way out, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, great to see you. Like, thanks for coming to the game. <laughs> <laughs> sort of thing. Uh, I want, my final thought is about an event that we're, uh, we're involved with this weekend. I'm going to be out at Lake Las Vegas uh, on Saturday. It's the second annual Lake Las Vegas collegiate rowing invitational and there's nationally ranked teams that are coming out uh, we will be out there as number one washington uh, as you look at some video here uh, the women's team washington crews the defending national champs you produce this video tony yeah of course um, we'll take on number 19 usc and then the second ranked washington men's team will be going up against ninth ranked dartmouth that's this saturday at Lake Las Vegas will be out there starting at 845 in the morning and you could uh, tune in. We'll put it on our Facebook page and it'll also be on Lake Las Vegas's Facebook page. Uh, it's good to see different sports. So that's uh, another sport that's uh, that's coming into town and the WCC tournament is here. Boy, what a great sports weekend. So try to get out there and see as much as you possibly can. We thank everyone for tuning in tonight for John Castanino, for Matt Gutierrez, for Rick Strasser, who has the night off. Haley Brooks, uh, she's good luck this weekend. She's out at the Speedway. Uh, for Luis Chalice Negretti, our producer, Richard Giacovino, I'm Tony Cardasco saying good night from Las Vegas on the Sports Adrenaline Show. See you next week.